Hello, everyone. Welcome to So Very Wrong About Games. I am your co-host, Mark Bigney, and with me, as always, is my loyal co-host, Michael Walker. How are you doing, Walker? Good. I'm just having a weird sense of deja vu, that's all. But I'm sure it's going to be fine. Well, good things come to those who wait. I guess also the podcast. And if you'll check your contract very closely, you will notice that there is an exemption for timely delivery in case of force majeure or active dog. And I was introduced yesterday to the weather phenomenon known as a snow squall. It's not so much the snow, it's the squall. It's, they're super fun here in Kingston. The visibility was so bad that I could barely limp home after attempting to get to the scenic swag studios here in the finest of Kingston basements. And I'm no stranger to inclement weather, but uh, when visibility is that bad, I didn't think it was a good idea to be on the road with all the rest of the yabos. Yeah, so this is a whole new time for recording for us. It seems very surreal and different. Well, we used to have to do this if the original versions vanished into the ether during the early days of rather bad technical gremlins. The before times. The before (laughs) times. Yeah, so well, there's that. So uh, we're going to mix things up today. We're going to talk about board games. We're going to talk about the game we reviewed last year in the as-yet-unnamed retrospective intro segment, The Aurus. We're going to talk about the games we played last week. We're going to talk about the news and why it doesn't matter. And our topic today is going to be video game adaptations, the tabletop adaptations of video games that the kids are playing these days. Damn kids. So, as yet unnamed retrospective intro segment, The Aurus, we reviewed last year Hellboy the Board Game on the topic of adaptations, although not a video game adaptation. I have since acquired more content for the Hellboy board game, and I've enjoyed it every time I play it. It's a little more setup and time intensive than a lot of the other ones of its ilk, say Street Masters. It's more along the lines of... Ultra Quest in terms of difficulty of setup and, and complexity management, if we just want to compare other Sadler Brothers games. But I still think it's worth it. I haven't played it quite as much as I would like to, but I've been able to bust it out for solo play during the terrible isolation times. Yeah, I definitely want to get back into it more because you have more interesting stuff. Just unfortunately, when people keep trying to put out these campaigny dungeon crawlers and we're constantly faced with new ones to try. So hopefully we can get back to playing a good one. Absolutely. Hellboy definitely, I think, still stands head and shoulders above most of the rest of the stuff that gets released. I still really, really like the way the scenarios are pitched in terms of it's almost like the way Betrayal at House on the Hill wanted to work, where you're kind of sort of trying to figure things out in the first half, and then there's this dramatic reveal, and then you figure out what's going on. I think it works a lot better in Hellboy, largely because the you know the haunts are all over the place in Betrayal, and also just because it's so sol- solid mechanically, and I think it does a lot of things really, really well. So I'm still glad to have Hellboy, and I'm still glad to come back to it every once in a while. Agreed. And that is the game we reviewed exactly one year ago. Now on to the games that we played this week. Mark, what did you play this week? I played Cerebria the Inside World, and I'm very happy that I did. Got together with some people who are big fans of Mind Clash who had not tried Cerebria. Cerebria is definitely their... I I would say a a Mind Clash's current catalog is the one that people have been least exposed to. It's also probably the strangest. You know, Tricarion and Anachrony are not exactly mainstream, but they're a little more straightforward, and they they rest a a little bit more easily in the standard tropes of a lot of Euro games. But Cerebria is very dense and very heavy and also very psychedelic, and strange and also it's one of those games that i very much enjoy which are dense and full of choices and lots of trade-offs but also shockingly short i mean it's a little bit awkward the first time you play where there's a 45 minute rules explanation and then the game itself only takes an hour some people find that unsatisfying i find it intriguing if i actually like the game i'm like oh that's great now that i know now that i'm in the system now that i at least understand how it works and the core of cerebral well, is actually going to stick around in your head relatively well so i'm looking forward to getting more cerebral players out there we played a full play a four-player game And I got to try a new aspect of Bliss, because I always end up on Bliss, but I always end up taking empathy, because people shove it onto me. They're like, oh, you you, you take this one. And I'm just too obliging. That's why I'm on the side of Bliss, and I take empathy. There you go. So this time I got to play Love, and it was great. And uh, Love's Power relies on fortifications. Fortifications are a thing that I often tend to leave off to the side. So I'm like, great, I will try something new. I will fortify like crazy. And I did, and that was the margin of victory. Because fortifications can also end up scoring extra if you arrange things properly. And it's these lovely little puzzles about how to use the available resources and you're short on actions and short on willpower and short on ambition and all those things. And actually, that sounds exactly like my life. Short on action, willpower, and ambition. At least that's what your dad told me. Anyway, so I really like Cerebri the Inside World. I think it's really something special. If you are a jaded Eurogamer, 
I absolutely recommend you check it out if you haven't already. Mind Clash is a wonderful publisher, and I don't mean to... I, I, again, I, I very much like Anachrony, and I still haven't tried Tricarion, strangely enough. I should really try it. People say good things about it. But for me, Cerebria is really an indication of a publisher that's confident and knows what it's doing and can handle a complex game that nonetheless really comes together in a very focused type of way. It's much more focused than Anachrony. It's much more focused than a lot of other sprawling games, even ones that I like and much more focused than a lot of the ones I don't like. So I highly recommend it. Cerebria, the Inside World. Yeah, looking forward to playing that one again as well soon. I got to play Shadow Rift. There was a few expansions that we got that uh, we haven't been able to try. One most likely Boomtown and the Goblins. And uh, I think they've upped the the difficulty, which is great because it was getting kind of like a cakewalky. So this was fantastic. This uh, mechanic adds like traps to all the different monster placements. So in, it, before you're even allowed to attack the monster, you have to flip up this trap that's in the space and then either take damage or or it stops you from damaging the monster or, you know, other stuff happens. And very interesting mechanic, nice twist, new cards that you get to put in your deck. Overall, super good, even though like the first game we lost in the first couple of turns, which is always nice. And then we squeaked out, it was like the last turn. It was like, literally, if we did not kill it this turn, then we would have lost. So it's nice when it comes nice and close like that at the end. And that is Shadow Rift, a cooperative deck building, save the town type of game. How do the traps work? Do you actually put them in the monster spaces? Yeah, just above Good. just above them, right? The, you know, you'll, the cards, the monsters will say, you know, put a card in, you know, phase one, phase two, or at the start, or if there's not one in this space, you know, all different types of wording, you know, mm. all different ways they can come out, but they just go above the space. And then, like I said, you have to, you know, deal with them before you can attack the monster. Good, because otherwise I can imagine it being very easy, easy to forget. Yeah, the only thing that uh, did sort of happen, sometimes they accidentally got slid along with the monster as opposed oh, sure. to, you know, make sure they stay in the space. So other than that, and for those who don't know, Shadow Rift has some some interesting mechanics that, you know, I haven't seen in many other games where uh, there's this whole row of townsfolk at the bottom and they're the ones you're trying to save, but they also help you, you know, in things you do. They give you some extra money or extra card draw or different you know, modifiers they can give you. but Without being in your deck. Without being in your deck, yeah. correct. They sort of like fill every round. And then if they get killed, then you put corpses in that pile. And then, you know, you, that slowly gets bogged down and you sort of have to try to cycle that out or minimize how many are in there. Or you can, sometimes more travelers come to the town and you can hire them and get them to stay. So it sort of, you know, balances out your deck. And I think that's just a very interesting part of Shadow Rift. I always found that notion amusing. You know, the prince wanders by. And you say, come join our village. And it's like, well, your village is full of corpses. Exactly. That's why we need you around. <laughs> That's right. We, we, need to, we, need to, we need one more person to balance it out. You could be prince of our graveyard. Here's five coins. <laughs> I played a game of Horizon Wars Zero Dark. The handworker and I love to play miniatures games, and he was in the mood for something cooperative, and so we pl- played another game of Horizon Wars Zero Dark. Not to be confused, of course, with Horizon Zero Dawn, which is <laughs> a video game that had a board game adaptation. More on that later. Horizon War Zero Dark is is amenable to Versus, but I don't think I'd ever really want to play it that way. And I've said a lot of things about Horizon War Zero Dark. I'm really much, very much looking forward to Roby Jenkins' follow-up work, which is going to be another game of spaceship combat called Horizon Wars Infinite Dark. Infinite? Yeah. N- That's really dark. None more dark. None more dark. And it was very nice. We got to do a lot of diversionary tactics and peeling off enemies. And there was a very cinematic moment where we thought we had things more or less in the bag and then a complication occurred and a whole bunch more spawns happened. And we were able to use the specialisms of our various troopers to great effect. He had a spy and a leader and we used the ability, the command and control capabilities of that combination to great extent. And I was able to blow people up, almost blew up the objective that was a little bit of a problem. Pro tip, when you've got an enemy that you really, really want to explode, but but they're standing close to the terminal that will unlock the objective. Don't, don't launch the missiles? You might want to be a little bit careful. It was, it was an instance where I, it was literally the case that I just got too enthusiastic. I showed up and I had my uh, my, my hacker armed with a one-use explosive weapon. And I w- d- this this person was, this, this enemy that they were firing at was heavily loaded up with buffs. And they were right in our way. And so we had to do something uh, about them. But I deployed the explosive weapon. And then I'm like, wait a minute. What's the 
base explosion radius of this weapon? Is it five inches or six inches? Because if it's six inches, we just lost. If it's five inches, we're okay. <laughs> like I was like, oh, it's five inches because the explosion went just shy. So, <laughs> other than that minor miscalculation, <laughs> the orphanage was saved. Uh, well, it wasn't an orphanage; it was just a terminal <laughs> that would then would reveal the location of a vault, and then we had to go unlock the vault, uh, which. My hacker then went and did while under crippling enemy fire, and just as he was about to get his uh, final shot, my hacker, Vinay, was like, see ya, and dove into the vault. So, anyway, th- these were really I love Horizon War Zero Dark. It is a marvelous indie tabletop miniatures rule system. I thoroughly recommend you check it out if you play any miniatures games, because if you have any sci-fi miniatures at all, congratulations. You have miniatures you can use for Horizon War Zero Dark. And that was Horizon War Zero Dark. I got to put Fujikuro back on the table. It's designed by Jerome Demir. And published by Game Brewer. It is one of these sort of adventure type games. You're playing uh, a samurai or a ninja or a geisha or... A stereotypical uh, Japanese uh, person. Uh, yes. A Yoshimbo. And uh, has like a Minecrafty sort of element to it where you're actually building your weapons with these cubes and it actually matters. The length of it is your initiative. The types of cubes you're putting in are the types of dice you're going to be rolling in combat. And you also have helmets to, you know, absorb damage and sandals to walk across lava. And it's one of these games that's nothing like Mage Knight. Not at all. Not at all. You reveal uh, hex tiles and then populate them with enemies and other stuff. And then if you move into a hex with an enemy, it automatically attacks you. None of this happens in Mage Knight, so it's nothing like it. Um, Plus, it's a deck-building game that relies on card combos and careful puzzle planning with respect to combat, right? Exactly. Oh, wait, no, it has none of those things. I see. I, it had to be an exact ripoff. I see. Anyway, <sighs> let's move along. And unfortunately, the misgivings you had in it came up in spades in this game where two of us got to actually play the game. We were off in <laughs> one corner of the map where we, our sacred skulls, our personal sacred skulls came up, which gives you, you know, special abilities and stuff like that. And, and we had dragons where the other player was m- rushing around madly, flipping over tiles where he'd get hardly any scrolls and no dragons. And then the game ended. So unfortunately he did not get the full experience, but I still just when you when you put a box down and you're opening up and you're setting up the game and you're 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 actually excited, you just know I just really love this game. It looks fantastic fantastic. The production is amazing. It has this great timer as soon as you know someone hits thirty points, then you start putting these lava pieces all over the map. So it gives you the sense of urgency to get out and it's just a overall very interesting game. And I love it. Fujikuro. We get to try Kingdom Rush Rift in Time. This is a game that you would express some enthusiasm about. You're currently pledged, I believe, for the follow-up that is currently up on GameFound. This is by Helena Hope, Senfun Lim, and Jesse Wright. I'm not familiar with the works of the first and third designers, but Senfun Lim is the co-designer of Junk Art, probably all told one of my favorite dexterity games. Kingdom Rush is an adaptation of a video game. More on that later. The, the origins, correct me if I'm wrong, the original product is a tower defense type of thing. Correct. And sure enough, this is another version of Tower Defense. Tower Defense has, has gone through several different iterations, or at least several different fundamental approaches when being adapted into tabletop gaming. And in this one, what you have is, it's a, it's it's weird, it's a polyomino game. What you have are these cards with grids and little pictures of enemies on them, and you play these cards, which are supposed to be towers, but really you're playing a card. It's, it's a card that you can play every round, sure, but mark, the tower that was over mark, here could be it, way over there at this time. It's a tower mark. Okay, but don't, it, don't break the immersion. <laughs> uh, my my, ex- I don't know how it works in the in the original game, but my experience with towers are when you build a tower, they are not subject to strategic redeployment next round way over on the other side of the map. This is true. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that I hadn't lost my mind or I'd forgotten what a tower is. And the towers will put out a specific polyomino piece that you then try to use to cover various enemies. And it ended up feeling to me an awful lot like a special puzzle, which is not exactly my bag. Now, there's a lot of other stuff you can do. You have your hero that activates and goes and does things, and there are powers to activate. But And that part I really liked. But the, the, the bit where you're trying to visualize how this polyomino that very often you can't rotate or flip will fit over this precise combination of enemies, that part really started rubbing up against the, 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 the parts of my mind that really aren't good at that. I was the opposite. I love that type of puzzle. Uh, and it's even more than that. Not only can you not turn it or flip it, but depending on where the tower is, you have to place it and it comes straight out. You can't, you even have to put it, you know, it's locked in the way it can go. 
And when I saw the heroes, I was kind of disappointed. It's like, why do they put them on these like giant square bases? That's <laughs> that's ridiculous. It looks it looks silly. But the hero actually goes on the card as well and covers up squares. And I thought that was amazing. And I love the fact that you can actually upgrade uh, the towers. I really like, even though I'm going to say that it's really, a, I feel as though it's a solo game. I feel as though it, it, it will come uh, to more fruition if you just play it by yourself. It'll be more fun. But the way they did incorporate, you know, the multiplayer is where you can give up playing some of your towers and they automatically upgrade and they go to the next player. I like how that sort of, you know, brings everyone into the game and sort of makes it a team effort. I agree with you that the upgrading of towers was great because, as I say, you can play the towers every turn. Instead of playing them, though, what you can do is just effectively skip a turn and then pass the upgraded version to one of your friends. And that, that, that was wonderful, you know, tempo versus efficiency, and you have to upgrade towers to deal with the portals, which are effectively the bosses, because some portals can't be damaged by low-level towers. That part was great. But you're, you're also exactly right. It is multiplayer it, it, multiplayer committee if you're going to pl- play with multiple people because there's no attempt to redress alpha gaming or sock puppetry, which I don't object to very much. It was a little bit – it's only a little bit of a problem in that I don't didn't really feel like I had a whole bunch of sense of ownership over my own character. But part of that was because, admittedly, we were playing a relatively early scenario where you don't have a full suite of special abilities. It's a heavily scenario-driven game. It goes so far as to tell you where each player can deploy their towers, which was strangely restrictive. And in our play, I effectively only used one tower placement ever – by virtue of how the, the, the lay of the land worked. And so kind of like Fujikoro, but not in as bad a way, I was off on one side of the board doing my thing, and you and Huey were off on your side of the board doing your things, dealing with your your towers. And so that, that actually helped cut down on the, <laughs> on the committee problem because the committee had no reason to confer. Uh, so, you know, there's a number of rough edges and a number of ways in which the game isn't really for me. But I will say it's it's fast and delightful and visually charming. And you can overcome the spatial puzzle elements if you're inclined to, which I am. And so I was. And so that didn't really bother me too, too much. And I'm glad you enjoyed it. And, yeah, I've also played it solo two-handed because the the, the pure solo mode, you, you lose out on that cool element of passing the towers back and forth to different players, which is really, really neat. So I, I wasn't interested in trying that. And solo two-handed was fine. Uh, so it's, it's one of those standard problems of, do you want to play a game by yourself or do you want to play a game with other people? But at the, at the end of the day, the other people are only adding their social benefit, which is awkward from a design perspective, but fine from a social perspective. True. And I should, I should say that the solo part would be just, just how I look at it. Cause I really like just to sit and figure out that puzzle, you know what I mean? And do optimize, you know, how my turn would go. Whereas some people might get something else out of the game. So it's sure. just the part that I enjoyed was the spatial puzzle and figuring out exactly how to destroy all the enemies in one turn where I'd like to just sit there and figure it out by myself and not worry about holding other people up uh, or people jumping in or stuff like that. But other than that, maybe the the, the multiplayer will appeal to other people. Yeah, absolutely. As, as we keep saying, the whole issue of alpha gaming or sock puppetry is, is less of a game design problem and often more of a social group problem. We don't have that problem. You have internalized stresses because you feel like you don't want to hold the game up. But generally speaking, the atmosphere of our games tend to be very, very collaborative in the best possible way. So it's not a huge downfall. And, and again, I'd be, I'd be happy to try it again if you're inclined or if you just want to figure out the solo puzzles by yourself, you should absolutely go do that. Anyway, so that was Kingdom Rush Rift in Time. Speaking about video games, made into board games. We got to play an Eric Lang and Michael Schnell game called Bloodborne the Board Game. Now, Eric Lang had already put out a card game under this sort of same umbrella, which which I... Did you, did you get a chance to play it? Uh, I did, but I should point out that Umbrella is in Resident Evil, not in Bloodborne. <sighs> Listen. There are a million strange weapons in Bloodborne. I don't think an umbrella is one of them. No umbrella guns? Unfortunate. That is a shame. That is one way that Pandemic Legacy Season Zero is preferable to Bloodborne. Yes, I did, I did play Bloodborne the card game. All right. So these are both put out by Simon. It looks fantastic. It has some very interesting card play. It had some very interesting uh, – uh, I guess I've never played the video game, so I can't tell you. But apparently your weapon transforms. Is it very common? Is, like, is it back and forth – Depends on how you want to play it. Uh, you know, sometimes you might want your sword, and sometimes you might want it to be a Chevy Camaro, and so you transform it. Gotcha. So, so you're filling up your player board with these cards, and then when you transform your weapon, you get to clear your board and, and start playing more attacks. So I thought it was a very interesting way to incorporate that mechanic. 
then it just got to the weird uh how the map laid out and the movement it just seemed very arbitrary and abstract and i think it just could have been cleaned up a lot more it's a fascinating counterpoint in my mind to cthulhu death may die because both cthulhu death may die and bloodborne are these scenario driven kind of adjacent to dungeon crawl figures with special powers running around trying to achieve objectives with with some combat involved in Cthulhu Death May Die, the scenario design is often really clever and is usually at least very good. And moving around the map and trying to figure out where to stand and where to be and how to deal with the various enemies is very engaging and cool. And the actual combat is bone simple and stupid. And I'm fine with that. And then there's Bloodborne, the board game, where the combat is this fascinating little ta- tactical puzzle of different weapon speeds and different effects and different special bonuses you're going to get from your card and thinking you might know what the monster's going to do, but there's always a small chance that they're going to uh, upend your expectations and worrying about how the allies are going to come into it. And then everything else, as you say, the movement, the tile placement, because you're just pulling random tiles off of a pre-generated deck and going towards the, 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 the victory objectives of the scenario, all of that part rankled me. It wasn't terrible, but it definitely wasn't very good. And this all interacts with a weird timing element because the board resets every once in a while, which is fine and definitely consistent with the the video game, and it's a way to get respawns. But it leads to, to one of the things that I hate in games like this, which is wasted turns. Say you're ready to go fight the boss, and you're one round away from the Great Reset. Well, during the Great Reset, the boss goes back to full health, so there's no point in going and doing damage to the boss. So you're left there thinking, so what should I do? Uh, I don't really... I guess I pass. And stuff like that happens very often, all too often, by virtue of the way the scenario works. Now, but to reiterate, the combat element I thought was really, really cool. It seems simple. And when I saw the the Kickstarter campaign and the sort of summary of how it worked, I thought it would be simplistic. And indeed, it's simple to explain. The parameters are very simple. But you get these lovely little emergent problems, the way the monster design and the weapon design all comes together. That part was great. If there could be a universe where there was a game that was effectively the scenario system and fundamental setup of Cthulhu Death May Die, but a combat system that was as cool as Bloodborne, the board game, well then, I think... Yeah, it's called Gloomhaven. Um, <laughs> which, I, I disagree. The which, scenarios which, no, of Gloomhaven it is. are, here's a room full of monsters, kill the monsters. It's true. But, I mean, that, that combat deck that is in Bloodborne gave me the feel of the Gloomhaven sort of combat deck. It's like your mini deck and you're, and you're flipping up these mini bonuses, except in this case you actually get a hand that you get to look at and, and the fact that you get to modify it as well. I'm not saying it's exactly like Gloomhaven. I said when, uh, when we were playing it, it gave me that feel. The part that I like more about the way it works in Gloomhaven is you can get truly Baroque effects from a given monster. It's like this monster will then summon something or put out a trap or do a whole bunch of weird stuff. In Bloodborne, you had simpler effects, but you had the additional benefit of being able to look at the monster card and saying, okay, I've got a 50% chance they're going to do this, and if they do that, I'm going to stagger them and everything's going to be fine. True, the monster deck was definitely it was it, it, The fact that it was pared down and more simple made it more of a puzzle and less of an adventure. Agreed. But where I was leading with this is that it has this interesting thing that you get to upgrade your little combat deck. And then the very first scenario took that away from us. It's like, yes. It said there was this person that said, okay, these tokens that you get for killing monsters and that you use to upgrade your deck, which is the really cool part of the game, you have to give me all of those tokens. You you don't get to do that. Yeah. Like I say, the scenario design is I, I don't really enjoy. Most of it is just go to this tile, dump a whole bunch of resources. That will then reveal a boss tile somewhere else. Go to that tile and go kill a boss. The overarching framework was a grave disappointment for me. I don't know if I were steeped in the lore. I've, I played the video game a little bit. If I were fully invested in the lore of this place, which is mostly just people are crazy because there's this crazy thing, people are crazy and there are monsters, which is fine. I mean, I don't demand that it have to be a fully fleshed out thing. Like, I don't find the setting of Cthulhu Death May Die interesting, but I find what they do with it much more interesting. And so, uh, yeah, I, 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 I felt that the combat system was looking for more to hold it up. Every time I was doing a turn where I was just moving and interacting with the map, it felt like I really wasn't playing the game, even though I was. And so when you have those unsatisfying turns and you're not playing to your strengths, I think it's unfortunate. 
Now, and you're right. the The additional element of the of the scenario design was here's this here's the first scenario where you're trying to buff up. Oh, by the way, you don't get to buff up at all. That seems bizarre. I'd happily play it again. It's fine. It's fast. Like Eric Lang and Chanel know what they're doing. It's I can't imagine them designing a, a truly execrable game. And I was very pleased with how the combat system worked out. I just wish the rest of the game were half as strong. Yeah, and I, had, I just wanted to say one more thing that was good was the the actions. The fact that it was depend on the cards in your hand, it wasn't like a set, you know, you get this many actions. So you could start, you could puzzle out your turn that would let you draw more cards, which would give you more actions. And so it was a neat little puzzle that way as well. Absolutely. And that is Bloodborne, the board game by Simon. We streamed It's a Wonderful World, Corruption and Assumption. So every Saturday we have Parasocial Saturdays here at SWAG. This Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern, we are going to be streaming Barrage. We have also, as I had this in the news, we have a full day on Saturday of content for our listeners. At 10 o'clock, like we just said, we have Barrage. And at 3 p.m., I'll be featured on a Hungry Gamer podcast. He, he does a video podcast, and then when he premieres it, uh, he's there live. So I'll be there live as well at 3 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. So come by, and I'll answer any questions or any comments while we're watching the video. See you there. So we played It's a Wonderful World, Corruption, and Ascension. And this is the the drafting game that we have spoken about uh, before, which is very, very, very simple, but has a lovely little element of a production challenge whereby you really have to figure out how your timing elements are going to get that card out when you need it. And it's just marvelous how a simple change in production, how everything is in stages, leads to a wonderful little throughput problem of, well... I need this card so I can build black, uh, black cubes, but it's only going to come out after the yellow cubes that get produced. I need it. So how am I going to get it out in time? I really like that element of It's a Wonderful World. I still really enjoy it. And the Corruption and Ascension expansion, I think, does a very good job of making itself relevant. Because normally in, an expansion, in a game like this where you've got a, a fat deck of cards and you're going to build your tableau and draft it, the temptation is just to add more cards and shuffle it into the deck. But when the deck is already massive and you want to introduce an expansion of, say, 20 to 30 cards, well, you don't want the game to be all expansion cards or no expansion cards, which which might easily happen under no, normal circumstances. So it's an entirely separate deck. So in our player count, we would draft six normal cards and three expansion cards, and that's the hand from which you draft. And it's a lovely little way to make sure that the expansion cards always show up and you can always look at something new every hand. The game effects of the expansion are very negligible. It's about 10 to 15 seconds of explanation about how the new cards work. Some of them sap your production in interesting ways, which is neat. You know, they produce lots of other resources, but will sap your gray or vice versa or what what have you. I enjoyed the expansion. I thought it was a solid addition to what was already a very solid and enjoyable drafting game. I enjoyed it a great deal. Yeah, the thing I love about It's a Wonderful World is how long it takes. Because the even though the rules are, are not, I'm not going to say dead simple, but pretty straightforward, sometimes... It, it takes a little to understand exactly how the stages work, you know, while well, I'm going to get this resource, which will help me down the road, right? So it's nice that you get sort of like an intro game done. And even though we didn't play a game right away, you can always get two or three games in, right, in a, in a relatively short time. So it's nice the fact that you can sort of intro game it. And then once they get to the second game, they know exactly what they're doing and, and it'll be a better experience for everyone. And that was It's a Wonderful World, specifically the Corruption and Ascension expansion by Frédéric Girard and La Boîte de Jeu. I got to introduce the crew to Taverns of Tiefenhall. We just stepped right in with all of the modules and the more, I don't want to say the more I play it, the more I, I, you know, I'm not like, the more I play it, the more I see that it's much like Quacks of Quiglinburg, right? It's more of an experience. It's more of a sort of like a press your luck, whereas this is, you're actually, it's more based on the deck and, and trying to maximize not getting your guests filled up more often but it is it is a charming little game it is just a lot of fun for me to play and i am looking very much forward to the expansion that's coming out soon and this is designed by wolfgang walsh and put out by schmidt spiel and north star games and hoping to see that expansion soon so now on to the news and why it doesn't matter we talked about how we felt as though Kingdom Rush was a solo game. Here is another game that is made only for solo. And it's an IP, which I don't think I've seen yet. Like an, like a company spending the money to get an IP and to only put out a solo game. So this is a Kickstarter game called Batman The Dark Knight Returns. This is right out of using Frank Miller's art. 
it is has market has battering dice like how can you not want battering dice if you haven't seen them yet definitely check this out just to see the battering dice and this game is solo only so if you are a solo gamer definitely check this out if not just to get battering dice talk talk woodman which has gone under a variety of different iterations. There's Talk Talk Woodman, there's Click Clack Lumberjack, there's Bling Bling Gemstone, sometimes just Woodman. Which, Wait, don't forget the Golden Axe expansion. There's a, there are also expansions to various versions. Was a very simple and visually engaging dexterity game, which was kind of a reverse Jenga, where you were actually trying to knock things off of a plastic tower. There's a game called Bamboo Bash. Which was on Kickstarter and got pulled, being put up by Seth Hyatt of Sleeve Kings. Seth Hyatt is also involved in Mayday and also involved in Imperial. Uh, he used to be involved in the distribution of Talk Talk Woodman in North America because it's uh, originally a game from Asia. And uh, now there's Bamboo Bash, which is suffi- – okay, let me, let me put it's, it this way. It's different colors. It's different colors. There has been some spielkiss on the internet about how different it is, and I haven't played Bamboo Bash, and I don't want to review games that I haven't played, but I will say this. It is regarded as sufficiently similar to Talk Talk Woodman that, number one, the content creators that Seth Hyatt sent early production copies to aggressively compared the two. And number two, Seth Hyatt clearly thought they were very similar because he included a blurb from Quinns of Shut Up and Sit Down about Talk Talk Woodman in his campaign for Bamboo Bash. So... A number of people, including the designer of, T- of Talk Talk Woodman, specifically Justin O, oh, said this is unfortunate. This is the kind of sort of IP theft that seems a little bit, at the very least, de classe. And Seth Hyatt responded with a very long blog post saying, like, no, 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 this is entirely different. They're entirely different games. See, I re-engineered them. The plastic pieces look all different and the scoring is different. I am unpersuaded. Having read his blog post, if anything, I think the weakness of his arguments is the kind of thing that demonstrates how true the charge is. And again, he and his and the people reviewing his game basically concede the point that it is basically Talk Talk Woodman. So at the very least, it seems classless. And this is an example of the kind of argument that uh, Seth Hyatt deploys. He says, Secret Hitler is a retheme of the Resistance, which in turn was really just a retheme of Werewolf. End quote. That is not true. And if you think that Secret Hitler and the Resistance and Werewolf are only different by virtue of theme, then I don't think you understand what's that word, game design. And so I, I, I am utterly unpersuaded that Talk Talk Woodman is anything other than far too similar for this to be okay, even independently of the fact that Seth Hyatt was professionally involved in the commercial distribution of Talk Talk Woodman at some point. This is the kind of thing where, at the very least, you should unprompted give some collaboration with the designer and maybe you can take the same physical notion and then turn it into a fundamentally, fundamentally different game, but fundamentally different game doesn't mean, Oh, well, you know, in talk, talk Woodman, you, 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 you tap the tower twice in my game. You tap it three times. Oh, completely different game now. Ooh, three times. That's now, crazy. That having been said, I do want to just gesture towards the broader just, issue. Listen, Mark, we have to, that's innovation. <laughs> no, innovation is a different game. <laughs> Sorry. I do want to gesture towards the broader issue. There is absolutely a live issue about, well, was Thunderstone basically a ripoff of Dominion? I would say no. Should Thunderstone have acknowledged Dominion and acknowledged Donald X. Vaccarino in the rulebook? At a minimum, yes. We've been saying that for years, that it's appropriate for games like that. Now, then does a game like Core Worlds have to do the same? At this point, we start getting into judgment calls. But that's one of the reasons why you, dear listener, devote some time to us. You, to a certain extent, want our judgment. Or if you don't, well, then I don't know why you're listening. Maybe you're hate listening. That's fine. But then you want our judgment because you think it's so bad. But I think that a reasonable observer looking at Bamboo Bash will conclude that this is basically Talk Talk Woodman with the serial numbers filed off and with the plastic slightly changed. And I'm sorry, Mr. Hyatt, the fact that you had to re-engineer the plastic pieces just shows that you're an industrious rip-off artist rather than a lazy rip-off artist. So I would encourage everyone to take a look at all these justifications. By all means, disagree with us if you think that Bamboo Bash is sufficiently innovative and sufficiently different that you think that we're out of line. By all means, let us know. But failing that, uh, we are not going to be supporting the output of Seth Hyatt when it is this brazen. So on to something that's actually innovative. This is called Tiny Turbo Cars. And Mark, remember those interesting little slide puzzles you did as a child where you... The grid had to stay the same, but you had to slide all the squares around. And, you mean and the spatial puzzles? Spatial puzzles. I hated those. You love them, right? No, I hated them. So in this game, everyone has their own little con- console that has sort of like move forward to or turn or and, and you get to maneuver it around every turn and then you put it down and then you 
everyone does the, you know, sort of like Robo Rally style, everyone does their movement in order. And it so, looks like it's going to be a, a really fun, interesting little game. I'm excited to give it a try. It is a Kickstarter on Kickstarter right now, so check it out, Tiny Turbo Cars. On the topic of tiny things, I would just like to point out, I think this is a sign of progress in the industry, and I want to give high five to the people at Gamlin Games for making the right decision. Tiny Epic Dungeons. The cover art was released, and we saw new classes in the fantasy tropes. Uh, we've all played Wizards and Rogues, but this was the TNA Wizard and the Boob Rogue, which I think is absolutely a step forward and, and definitely new classes. Anyway, uh, Elizabeth Hargrave and other people on Board Game Geek and other media said, guys, this is not okay. This is not... No, please, stop. And they changed the cover art, which is great. Now, the actual discussion leading up to changing the cover art, and this is not the fault of Gamblin Games, involved all the standard whataboutism and all the standard eye-rolling and ridiculous bad-faith arguments. Nothing will make people resort to theory. Suddenly, every retrograde person who wants their, their, their cleavage in their board game starts resorting to gender theory the moment anyone starts pointing out this is problematic. This, to me, is the most simple objection imaginable. A person saying, this product isn't for me, would you consider my feedback publisher and try to make it more amenable to the market demands of, you know, having a board game where people of different backgrounds, and me included, might be able to enjoy it? And then suddenly people start whipping out theory as though they're Camus. It's ridiculous and tiresome and obnoxious, and I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. But in the midst of all that, progress. I'd say that the new cover art for Tiny Epic Dungeons is a vast step forward. I'm always happy when there are shining examples of good decisions made in good faith. Thank you, Gamlin Games, for improving your product. So, not very often, Mark, do video games make their way into board games. Maybe on a future episode we'll we'll talk about it. But Skyrim, the board game, has been announced. But we definitely got to get on board, Mark, because if we want to see it in the next 10 years, because it's being put out by Mordifius. Mordifius. Mordifius Entertainment. So, we've yet to see Siege of the Citadel, so maybe if we... <laughs> <laughs> we 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 look into it. It's going to be on crowdfunding, and it's going to go on GameFound, Mark, because you know it's very funny to read why they want to use GameFound. It's because you know it's very innovative and it's different than Kickstarter. It wouldn't be because you know people might read comments on their recent Kickstarter. You know, <laughs> I don't <laughs> projects and find out they're you know six years behind on on some of their there, deliveries. There are there are reasons to prefer GameFound. They they ha- I'm not, I'm not endorsing GameFound over Kickstarter or vice versa, but GameFound is an integrated fulfillment company as well. So you don't have to worry about then contracting with somebody else to do your fulfillment on the back end. They're slightly better at dealing with add-ons. You know, it, it was designed more to from, from from top to bottom to facilitate the delivery of complex board game Kickstarter projects. Or maybe they don't want people looking at Siege of the Citadel. And that is Skyrim, the board game. Coming in four years. Cole Worley has been working on John Company, tinkering uh, tinkering uh, substantially with it. It's going to be coming out on Kickstarter on March the 30th. John Company 2nd Edition with all new art and substantially re- reworked rules. I'm a huge fan of Cole Worley. I'm not alone in this. And I really, really like the new visual direction. Much more satirical. Much more about poking fun at the grandiloquence and absurdity of British colonialism rather than the 1st edition sort of, you know using images that kind of started to communicate the, gr- the, the, the grandness that they thought they had of British colonialism. Not that it was problematic. I mean, the game was already a satire about the British East India Company, but I, I now appreciate that the art is more overtly satirical. And I am very much in favor of him touching up the game rules because I thought that John Company First Edition was a fascinating, albeit sometimes clunky, experience. And if his work on John Company Second is anything like his work on Pax Premier Second, I think we're going to be in for something truly special. Of course, that would rely on our being able to get together in large groups to be able to play a game that is best at large groups. But it's on Kickstarter on March the 30th, so maybe we'll be vaccinated by the time it comes out. That is John Company Second Edition. Next up for me is Ragnaroks from the designer of Santorini. So if you enjoyed Santorini, he has a new game up on Kickstarter. It is another two-player but this is a, a more of a go type game where you're sliding guys around and blocking off areas of the map. And it's, uh, once again, we'll have a, a God theme to it with special powers and all the such. And, and it looks like it's going to be great. I looked over the, the rules that were provided and, uh, I backed it and we'll see how fun it's going to be. I'm a sucker for puns. Riding rocks is a pretty good pun. It's pretty good. Yeah. 
Finally, a bit of Patreon news from me. We reviewed Trickshot last week, very favorably, huge fans of Trickshot, and we have a spare copy that we are going to be giving away to one of our patrons, one of our commissioners or overlords in good standing. So if you are at all interested in getting your own copy of Trickshot sent to, sent to you by us at our expense, by all means, go check out Patreon if you are a commissioner or an overlord. We're going to be making a decision this week about who is going to get the game, and we hope that everyone gets to play Trickshot. Because it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So Magic finally jumped the shark, Mark. We're going to have uh, <laughs> 40K Magic decks coming out soon. Yeah. That'll be fun, right? <laughs> I think that's enough about that. And lastly for me is Pandasaurus announced a new game. And sort of, you know, Gods Love Dinosaurs came out of nowhere for us. I'm hoping this new one is just as fantastic. This one is called Brew. Just the art, lo- art alone has got me intrigued and the sort of play with dice and cards i think it's going to be an interesting little game looking forward to trying it brew by pandasaurus games and that is the news and why it doesn't matter now on to the topic of the week the theme brush that is the video game adaptation We've been playing a fair number of video game adaptations. I mean, this week alone, we played Bloodborne and Kingdom Rush Rift in Time. And in varying ways, we're both video gamers. And so we have certain thoughts about what games are adapted well and what games are adapted poorly. I have some important thoughts about, well, very important to me anyway, about games that are video games that are overdue for tabletop adaptations. Uh, so what are your thoughts, Walker? Well, I just want to get the silly stuff out of the way first. <laughs> because then we're going to get down to the serious real business. Exactly. So there's this big game out on, uh, it's like number one on the hotness list of Board Game Geek. It's called uh, Stardew, Stardew Valley, the board game. Yeah. And people are probably wondering why we haven't talked about it. I just want to make sure we reiterate our policy that we only talk about things that are interesting. <laughs> All right. Now on Not, to something. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. <laughs> I am interested in trying the Stardew Valley board game. Are you all well, there? People, you as there are some people I respect who say that it's quite good. Oh well, 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 I guess we'll give it a try. No, but th- this leads to one of the interesting, I- interesting points, though I think, because sometimes board game adaptations fail because they are too faithful to the source material, and sometimes they fail because they are not faithful enough. And I think that in the case of Stardew Valley, again, I haven't played the, the, the board game yet. This is one of those cases where you can't be too faithful to the source material. Because a, playing Stardew... Have you ever played Stardew Valley? The, I have the, not. The PC game? No. Or mobile game, for that matter? Stardew Valley, to a large extent, I, mean, I don't mean this as a pejorative, is busy work. Got to milk all your cows. Got to water all your plants. Got to go harvest everything. You got to go amass all these resources and then craft the thing that lets you craft the other thing and then bring your mayonnaise to market. I'm told it's all about mayonnaise. Ah, mayonnaise is the, is the key, is it? I, I, I don't know. I haven't played a whole lot. And video games like that aren't really for me. There are other video game busy work games that I do very much like. But when you're adapting a board game, you can't turn it into busy work. You can get away with some forms of busy work in, in video games. You absolutely can. It is my impression in my opinion, that you can't get away with busy work in board games ever. So, for example, when you are playing a game like Holler Tau or Agricola or Stardew Valley, you can't have endless phases where it's just about, oh, did you touch your barley? Oh, the barley withers and dies then, or what, what have you. you. You can plant the barley, you can harvest the barley, but all of these need to be at least vaguely mechanically engaging you can't have endless busy work functions. Oh, I want them to integrate microtransactions as well. <laughs> say, say you could harvest your, your barley in about 15 minutes, or you could buy this expansion for $5, which will let you harvest your barley right now. Well, not enough board games involve strategic advantages for the people who purchased the game. Some games say, you know, the start player is whoever owns the game, or actually in Millennium Blades, there are actually rules for if you are a Kickstarter backer, you include a certain card in your deck, but then everybody else gets to include that card too. So it's not really a strict advantage, it's just slightly different. I mean, there are, and some games, people, some style of video games people have tried to adapt and failed miserably. One of the style of games that people have been doing, trying to do for a while is sort of like vaguely something in the realm of Diablo. I play a lot of Destiny, 
It's not one of my better features. And when I said I like there are some video games that can do busy work very well, Destiny is a lot about busy work. It's like go do all your your, your patrols for the day. And, yes, the patrols involve shooting people, but they can't really harm you. So it's mostly about going into it. So it, it's a standard loot shooter model, right? Whether it's Borderlands, Diablo, Destiny, what have you. World of Warcraft is the same sort of thing. Yeah, you can't do that in a board game. It's not fun. You can't do the thing where you're endlessly grinding against lower tier mobs for whatever. whatever. That's one of the reasons why we love Assault on Doomrock. It's like, no, there are no lower tier mobs. You're going to do three fights and that's it. You're in, you're out. It's still a long game, but you're not going to be having these inconsequential combats. It's one of the reasons why people didn't really like Sanctum. It's one of the reasons why a lot of fantasy dungeon crawls don't work because they're like, well, you got to have endless mobs. No, endless mobs are bad. Bad. Lots and lots of small, inconsequential enemies are a bad call. You shouldn't do it. All right, last of the silliness. And then, <laughs> I was I, already well, on the serious I know, I didn't, I didn't get to finish. I'm just saying, oh, what, what, what designates what's, what's designates a video game is what I'm saying. What, what makes a video game is a game that you can only play on, the, on your computer, right? Uh, well, I'm, I'm mostly or, a console or on a, gamer. Or on a console. Yeah, I'm yeah. just saying that, that would be... A video game, then a video game brought onto the board. Now it's been an adaptation. So the silliness is 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 Carnegie a, a video game adaptation? <laughs> <laughs> because it was originally yeah, it was originally only available on PC. <laughs> it was on Board Game Arena, so it was, there was no physical copies available. So it was only a computer game. I would say it rela- relies on design intent. It was designed as a board game, and All so right. therefore, yeah. All right. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 like I said, it's silly. Yeah. Oh, oh, no, I picked up on that. And uh, just one more note on the getting back to my, my serious train of thought, I'm if you'll sorry. permit me. I, uh, okay. Uh, the one game, I think, that was too faithful to the source material and as a result largely failed was Dark Souls. Dark Souls is a game about trial and error and killing a lot of things, but then they regenerate and then you have to go and kill them all again and get to the boss and die at the boss and then go and get to the blah, 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 blah. And the board game is too faithful to that. And as a result, it just drags. You're doing all these inconsequential things. And when I'm in charge of dodge rolling for a character or using vague... I'm not saying that Dark Souls is the most twitchy game ever, but if I'm at least involved in doing it in a video game form, I'm willing to do that. I'm not a huge Dark Souls guy, but... In a board game form, doesn't work. And so sometimes being too faithful just doesn't function. Well, we're being t- uh, not faithful does work is when they did mechs versus minions. I think maybe they looked at their platform of League of Legends and said, I don't think we can uh, adapt this into a board game and, 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 really? and justify it. So they sort of gave you the same sort of streaming minions, but let you move around the board more freely and took out like, so it's not so it's such a linear going down the path sort of, wow. you know, like tower defense. It was more of a, you get to go wherever you sort of want. We'll give you these objectives, but sort of give you that feeling of, of mobs of guys, but let you do whatever you want and sort uh, of. It's strange. Other than the universe and some of the characters, I would not have thought to include mechs versus minions as a board game adaptation of video game. Cause it's, it, it's not seeking. I, I never saw it as seeking or managing to mimic the structures of MOBA style games at all. No, that, well, that's what I mean. I mean, the, the, a MOBA company wanted to put a board game, and instead of trying to force their game into a board game, they decided to go you know completely outside of the box. Is what this is exactly. What but I'm what about to all the very successful? Like we we spent an entire segment not too they, long ago. They did. I'm just saying they felt like, okay. I mean, sure. They, they felt as though they couldn't just you know give it the the feel that it needed. Or maybe they're just waiting for, you know, the right design. I don't know. Well, they decided to save all their uh, solid implementation chops for Telstones. Yes. Telstones. I, I, I'm i just, I can't believe that we, that it's just so good we can't put it into words yeah. in order to do a it's review It's the only game it. that is of such quality and of such depth that we feel ill-equipped to even address it in any way. Agreed. Yeah, but MOBAs are ex- exactly the class of game that I don't want to play in a video game format, but I find the conventions so cool and so interesting that I love the fact that we're now spoiled for choice and there are a lot of excellent MOBA-style adaptations. I've, As I say, I've loved almost all the ones that I've tried. Guards of Atlantis is probably my favorite, but there are lots of ones that do different things. And it's, it's, it's a great challenge for the board game adaptation because there are all these structures that you expect out of a traditional MOBA that are shockingly specific. Lanes of mobs, heroes that level up, the difference between farming and PvP, jungling as a possibility. Like, there are all these elements that are so specific. It's such a strangely specific and complicated structure that is so fertile for board game design. It's one of the reasons why I love playing the board game so much. Agreed. And I like how how different companies 
focus on different parts of what you, what you said and, and makes the game so different. Absolutely. Speaking of the same sort of thing as with XCOM, the board game, they have this vast, you know, tactical skirmishy type game where it's, I would, I would argue that the majority of the game is these troops fighting on the map, you mm-hmm. know, shooting guns at aliens, doing that sort of thing. And they decided to, to not ignore that, but just pull back and, and concentrate more on the logistical part, you know, sending the troops out, sending the fighters out, defending the planet as a whole as to, as opposed to like the, just the skirmishy type game. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk to you about XCOM, actually, because one of the things that is different between board games and video games generally is that most board games are fundamentally asynchronous when you're playing in real life, namely only in the sense that there's no time limit for what you're doing. The ones that involve a time pressure are actually the minority. And video games tend to be, as a general rule, the opposite, broadly speaking. Of course, there are tons of turn-based things, but but it, it's an inversion. Here in XCOM... You actually have a situation where you have a turn-based video game turned into a real-time board game, which is a fascinating choice because I did not associate time pressure in any way with my experience of playing XCOM. No, you're, like well, well, when you're – not when you're uh... – researching stuff you know when you're researching stuff mm-hmm. you sort of can only research certain things and that, that's all put on sort of like oh, a, on a timer right and if you i think with the players that play it uh over and over again they they understand that you can only get certain number of researches in between turns between each fight so you sort of have to decide quickly on what you're going to get done and and they, research first but they could have modeled that the same way and i'm not saying this is not a criticism this is just an observation they could have modeled that the same way that the video game did what uh, did just in terms of you have a certain number of research phases or you have a certain number of research points or whatever to to, to limit there didn't have to be a temporal limit on the ability of people to manipulate components in a real time game and I, there's also the fact that you observe that for me xcom is primarily a tactical shooter type of thing. Whereas in the board game, that is one of the things they minimize to the greatest extent, which is one of the reasons why I've never really sought it out. I should really try it someday. But that, that, that to me is, is one of the textbook cases of a very interesting set of choices. I, again, I can't comment not having played the game, but taking a turn-based thing mostly about combat to turning it into a real-time thing mostly about management. Well, I'm just wondering if they, I don't saying they'd never played Space Hulk, but maybe they just wanted that sort of stress feel. You know, Space Hulk, you have that time room between turns and it's that constant pressure. And maybe they just wanted that kind of feeling in this game as well. I wanted to flag Space Hulk, actually, because management of time, just talking about XCOM, management of time is one of those things that board game adaptations have to start considering. And I, I, I've said it before, I'll say it again, Space Hulk, although not a video game, there was a video game adaptation of the Space Hulk board game, actually, yes. which did some interesting things with time in and of itself. But I still maintain that having the Marines, because they are so slow, having to act fast... And having the aliens, because they are so fast, having being able to act slow is one of the most brilliant game design decisions for evoking a certain kind of feeling. Because that is one of the, the things about adaptations that are so fascinating, right? Because the best adaptations manage to evoke certain sets of feelings, despite the fact that they are so radically different from their source material. Like, for example, the, the time for me, and this is an entire family of adaptations, I don't know if you have much to say about them that Exceed came into its own was when I was playing the Street Fighter version and I was playing Sagat versus Ryu and it felt in many ways like an actual game of Sagat fighting against Ryu in a lot of the different Street Fighter versions. Now there are a whole lot of stuff and I'll talk about them in a second that fighting game adaptations don't tend to get that are very prevalent in the in the video game adaptation but it was just a, a, a set of priorities and different sort of general tactics and a, uh, a strength for, a strengths against weaknesses that the Exceed version managed to capture that finally made me feel that this was a format I could get behind. And it was just an interesting uh, design challenge of how do we take this property that people know and love and make it feel like you're playing the same thing. Because you don't, when you're adapting a movie, you don't have to do that. When you're adapting a book, you don't have to make it feel like the source material. You just can often just either well or badly slap on the characters in the setting and you're, you call it a day. But if you want to adapt Street Fighter, it had better feel a little bit like Street Fighter. Yeah, those little, you know, those little call-outs, those little things that you see in the game, like even in between levels or whatever, when they do that, do the, you know, little animations or things. If you incorporate that within the game, then it gives that people that overall feel. That's true. But again, I'm not talking so much about that. I'm talking about the elements of the design. Yeah, yeah um, well, that's what I'm saying. I was adding that on. I know, I understand what you're sure. saying. Like, okay. Uh, when certain moves work certain ways against other characters, right? If you incorporate that into mm-hmm. your game, I understand. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. 
And there are a whole bunch of things that fighting games, and here I'm talking primarily about Exceed and Battlecon, two series from Level 99 games that I really, really like. They don't incorporate verticality, for example, which is a very important element in most 2D fighting game, in almost all 2D fighting games and even many 3D fighting games. I have never been a Marvel vs. Capcom guy or... or um, even the, the Justice Gakuen series back in the day. But verticality, even in your standard Street Fighter uh, models, is important. Now, one thing they do tend to capture very well is footsies, which is a very technical set of things that happens in fighting games. Other things they don't do at all, like punishing. There's no notion of punishing, generally speaking, these things. It's usually just some sort of rock, paper, scissors. I've outsmarted you and my move work, so yours doesn't. But nonetheless, as I say, it's a fascinating set of design decisions you have to make in terms of what can we model, what are we not going to model. I haven't played the Street Fighter Miniatures game yet. I will sooner or later. I'm not terribly optimistic, but we'll see how it works out. I have a a whole bunch of games here to talk about, and maybe we should just go through them. Sure. Or I have two things at the beginning that I didn't talk about either. Uh, Sometimes you don't need... The game doesn't have to be particularly good. It's just the video game has such... Uh, popularity oh, yeah. and people just the the collectability of that game will drive sales, right? Sure, that's there's true a, of any a, adaptation. Yeah, and there's all sorts of ones out there. There's like the Pac Man game and Super Mario game and Centipede and all these other games that just rely on the actual IP in order to generate sales. Sure, but then again, like ones we've talked about already are are uh, do take time. Care is taken, and the fact that these already have a built in fan base, right? That these things will do well. So Sid Meier's Civilization and New Dawn, we've talked about that in the past. It's a great uh, adaptation of the video game, or I shouldn't say that. It's, it's a, it gives you the overall general feel. As Civilization games go, I think they did a great job. Although in the, in the computer game, it doesn't, I think they pulled away enough from the video game and, and gave you a game. Like there's none, that notion of the card system is not in the video game, but I think it was a good call in the board game. Well, all the Civ adaptations lead to a fascinating question. It's been a long, unresolved question about to what extent, if any, Sid Meier was influenced by Francis Tresham. Because Francis Tresham's civilization predates Sid Meier by several years. And there were some claims that Sid Meier owned a copy of Francis Tresham's game. Sid Meier had sometimes claimed that he wasn't influenced by Francis Tresham, although, of course, this was further complicated by lawsuits. So let's just posit that there's a possibility, I'm not saying this happened, that this is a board game that influenced a PC game that then spawned board games. So the snake has fully eaten its own tail. And Doom the board game, it has several iterations on uh, in board game form- format. There was a... Fantasy Flight one years and years ago, and then the new one that just came out recently, also by Fantasy Flight. Yes. And I played both. Both are great. But I think I played both as well. But I think this is an interesting question, again, of how you're trying to adapt it. So the first Doom, which was basically kind of Descent. Yeah, Descent. More Science fiction Descent. It was a slow, plodding experience. Even people who liked it, it's, it's a very slow, deliberative kind of thing, which is not, to my mind characteristic of the experience of playing Doom. The new version, which is still confusingly just called Doom, although now it's in all caps, which is following the convention of the new Doom video game, which was also just called Doom, (laughs) managed to incorporate one of the clever bits that the new Doom had, namely this idea of glory kills, the incentive to get close and to maintain the sense of visceral momentum. So it wasn't about hiding behind cover and trading shots at long range, which is sometimes engaging and fine. Some of my favorite games are like that. But Doom was supposed to be all about, you know, kinetic momentum and always moving forward and running around a map. And the way they did that in the board game was they're like, well, can we involve glory kills both to keep up the momentum and to make it feel more like the property? And I think they did a great job of both. When a, when a monster is sufficiently wounded, you can kill them just by moving into their space. You don't have to use an attack. You don't have to use any of your resources. You just keep moving. And I thought it was great. It was a, it was one of those things where it gets so much done all at once. It makes it feel more like the property. It keeps up the momentum. And at the same time, gives it that same visceral sense that the original had. So... And we do, can you can do a direct comparison with Gears of War. I think they did a, you love Gears of War. At first I didn't like Gears of War. I didn't like uh, the, the sort of abstract movement, right? You're sort of just moving from tile to tile. These tiles look great, great scenery on them and stuff. And it didn't really matter where you were on that tile, right? And for whatever reason, that just rubbed me the wrong way. So at first I didn't get much into it. But then you inter- actually introduced me to playing it. And it turned out to be a fantastic little game. Yeah, the which... 
again, was about the overwhelming importance of cover. It wasn't so much about where you were. It's just, are you within range? Are you in cover? That's the important thing. And the, 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 the movement system captured that rather well. And then there's the... Most like most of these games, they are a, a sort of usually sometimes a PvP shooter. And I don't think there's very many games. So there's this will be a comparison between Frag, uh, a terrible game, versus Adrenaline, which is not a direct uh, incorporation of a video game. But they definitely want to, uh, we're going for that feel of a PvP shooter with uh, board game elements. And I think they did, even though it didn't appeal to me, it, they still, I think, did the best job so far at capturing that feel of a PvP shooter. I'm not really in a position to comment because I don't really pay, play PvP shooters, but I find it fascinating when a game seeks to be kind of a, not a rip-off, but clearly derivative of the IP of a game and then not seek to emulate the gameplay of the game at all. I was reminded of this when playing Guardians by Plaid Hat, and Dr. Stallone kept pointing out, and I then went and saw, and indeed how correct it was, how all the characters and some of the locations were very, very, very clear homages to Overwatch. And it's a 1v1 game, and it doesn't feel like a shooter at all. <laughs> it feels like a, a, a sort of an area control tug-of-war contest. And maybe if you're deep in the weeds of games like Overwatch, you'll say, ah, but that's really what Overwatch feels like. But it seemed to me an interesting take of, well, we want to kind of copy the IP, or at least reference the IP, but we, we're not interested in producing the same kind of gameplay experience. And then both you and I enjoy Jetpack Joyride, and we played the original MOBA game. MOBA, not MOBA. No. Mobile, mobile game. There you go. But uh, it is a super fun little spatial puzzle, which you, you seem to overcome in this particular case. But it is super fun. Well, this is, again, one of those cases where using time in a clever way can help you – it can help the game feel more like the source material than it would otherwise. Because Jetpack Joyride in the mobile experience is a pure Twitch experience. You're just tapping frantically to try to dodge various things. And it doesn't feel like a spatial puzzle at all, in part because you can't see the rest of the route. You can only see so far ahead of you. Whereas in the board game, you see the entire route all out, and it's about finding, puzzling out the best route. But then they figure, well, if we make it real-time, then it will feel more like a Twitch-based Twitch experience. And without that real-time element, it would, it would still be fine uh, as a game by itself, but as an adaptation, as a way of copying the formalisms and the experience of playing the game, all you would have would be the visual references, which, again, is not necessarily makes you a bad product, but in terms of a faithful adaptation of the source material, which sometimes is bad, it would have been a different beast. And I, All the Blizzard games, I think, were not terrible either. They had There's a bunch of World of Warcraft games that came out. The one that I like is the, the, really big, the World of Warcraft, the board game. Right. I thought it was a great idea. They did a very interesting sort of... I know there's been a lot of dice pooling games, but just the way they did this particular one, I have not seen duplicated anywhere else. I thought it was great. Now, there's some kinds of games that I very much like playing in digital format that I don't think could really be adapted. One of the the big class for me is roguelikes. I've been playing roguelikes for a very long time, even long before there was such a thing as roguelites. Uh, my favorite being Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup. I have devoted lots of time to Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup. And one of the things that initially appealed to me about Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup was that if you look at the designer's notes, the way they talk about designing the game, it sounds very much like the designer's notes for a board game. It sounds like a lot of their priorities are the same. Like one of their priorities as dis differentiated from NetHack is they want every keystroke to be consequential. They don't want you to have to worry or bother with things that don't matter. If it's not in a decision, if it's not an important inflection point, if it's not something of consequence, they want they, they want it to be abstracted away. I'm like, that sounds exactly like a board game. You don't want to have meaningless moves in a board game. And they managed to nonetheless get this incredibly rich world that you would expect out of a roguelike, namely, no two games will ever be the same, vast difference in terms of quality of, of gear and character progression and so forth. But... Again, a lot of it is about killing very low-level monsters and gradual upgrading of gear and various technical dances about religion and so forth. And it's just pff, would not want that kind of thing adapted. I'm wondering if this is why this, there's this strong feel towards legacy games because I think maybe that's what a video game is, right? It's a game that morphs, you know, what your decisions now change later where you can't really get that in a board game because, you know, you have static pieces. But now you're introducing these legacy elements, which makes it more like a video game. Sure, but whether I'm grinding away at one session at a single sitting or grinding away over several sittings, that doesn't do a whole lot to 
help the fact that I'm doing something. No, curious. no, I wasn't trying to fix your problem. Sure. Mine, those are just general comments yeah, yeah. on legacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For games that I'd like to see, I, I talked about wanting a Among Us type board game or a card game or something that was sort of like a, you know, a social deduction. It's like Space Cadets. Remember that space, I already talked to you about the Space Cadets. We had all the little mini games that, and that sort of thing where you're busy heads down trying to get this little mini game so you're not seeing other people trading cards around or what other people are doing because you're too busy with your head down trying to complete your mini games. Something like that. I think it would be interesting. I would be very surprised if you would nonetheless enjoy a game like that. I hear what you're saying and I think that there's fertile ground there, but Based on my experience with you and playing social deduction games, I don't think that would pull you into the genre. And ones that they actually have that I want to try. I haven't tried Bioshock Infinite Siege of Columbia. Eh, it was all right. It was all right. But I, it, 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 was looked... just, it was just a Troops on a Map game. And so as a result, it didn't feel like... You often see these. Like, this was true of War of the Ring, right? The, the story of Bioshock or The Lord of the Rings is about a small group of people against the backdrop of a larger war. And in both Bioshock Infinite, the board game, and in War of the Ring, they're like, now we're not going to focus on those characters that were actually part of the game. They're just going to be side events. We're going to focus on this other thing. It's like, which is a fine choice, I guess, but doesn't really feel like being faithful to the source material in the way that I would want to play an adaptation. And there's a Risk game that you really like. You haven't talked about that yet. Mass Effect Risk? Mass Effect Risk. I'm a big fan of Mass Effect Risk. <laughs> I think it does a very good job of capturing the broader war because at least in Mass Effect 3... It was all about the broader war. It wasn't, you know, the, 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 the salient characters were, of course, the salient characters, but you can justify an adaptation where those characters fade into the background because you cared so much about the broader conflict. And I think it does a very, very good job of adapting the source material. I'm, I, I yeah, like it. Good. And you picked up Jagged Alliance. And I really wish I had a chance to play that board game. It was all right. And did you play the video game back I, in? I, I never did. See, that's what I mean. So now we have no comparison. You played the board game but never played the video game, and I only played the video game. So. Yeah. So, unfortunately, we don't get to... It's a shame. What I want adapted, because this is a video game property that I think could be for... Like, again, my some of my favorite games in the video game format, I don't think you could capture them in a board game format. Things like Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup, things like Spec, Op the, Spec Ops The Line, things like The Walking Dead Season 1. You know, the, the, those seminal moments of storytelling. And or, in the case of Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup, massive universes of modifiers and things don't really lend themselves to tabletop. But, so Star Control 2 is the greatest video game ever made. Any sane individual acknowledges this. And I think there's lots of things you could do with the Star Control universe in the board game format. Now, now would you have it in an adventure type game where you where they, they focus more on the moving around the systems or would it be more on the actual spaceship combat? My preference would probably be not to have the grand sweeping adventure type thing. My preference would probably be some kind of thing, either A, focusing on the ship combat, or B, focusing on interspecies politics, either before or after the any of the great unification wars, before or after the Samatra. I mean, there are a number of different times when you could choose it. We could get out the personalities of the different races. I want to see a game where the Chenjezu and the Spathy are arguing about military commitment. I want to see that game. <laughs> we'll just retheme Top Gun. Instead of, you know, the, being the back and forth of the volleyball, it'll be back and forth of political issues. And then when you're done that, you, you go to the side and do your little ship-to-ship -ship combat. Oh, my goodness, that might actually work. <laughs> That's frightening. It might actually work. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. The other one I want to see is uh, there's a game called Card Hunters, and they, they totally play off the spoof of a actual card game, mm -hmm. but it's in video game format. It's like a Dungeons & Dragons type game, and you're putting up these standees, and I think it would be a great, just like, you know, the the Spanish... Uh, Pirates of the Spanish Pirates, Right? Yes. And you can do it in the same sort of thing, because it's all, even on the screen, it, they're two-dimensional standees, and, oh. and you move them around, and it's all about deck building, and, and, and I'd like want to see it like hardcore magic style that, you know, the more boosters you bought, the better your deck would be. Because <laughs> that's, you know, very much how the game worked, and, and I, I would love to see it. Well, there's an entire class of PC games, especially, that are basically card or board games that you would never want to see adapted in real life, like Slay the Spire or Monster Train. Or what, you know, take your pick. There's a million of them now. Outlands is probably my favorite. And 
I don't want them adapted into a physical format because one of the reasons why they work is a computer game can leverage all these modifiers and tracking universals and all those other things that I don't want to deal with in real life but work fine in a digital form. Yeah, like the, the deck progression in these games is ridiculous. Like having right. to, if you want to implement that in real life, you know, having to keep cards sorted and, and slowly introducing them and then when you're done putting it all back would be ridiculous. Tracking bleed seven going down to bleed six and then tracking two stacks of stun and then this exactly. other but Yeah, exactly. That's, that's another one of the reasons why a whole bunch of rogue likes or rogue lights that I very much enjoy, enjoy I don't want to see hit the table. One of my favorite games of all time is Risk of Rain. And Risk of Rain is a marvelous game and it has but just would never, ever work in any serious way in a tabletop adaptation because by the end of the game, you've got about 50 different rolling modifiers and things that could proc a tenth of the time and... Yeah, would never want to have to deal with that. There's a couple here we forgot to talk about. Rampage, a.k.a. Terror Maple City. It does a great job of capturing how boring the original is. Exactly. I love the video game, but it gets dull real quick. I actually have, yeah, I agree with you entirely. And then we didn't talk about all of the, where is it, uh, Fallout stuff that's been done. There's like three or four Fallout games now. And again, that's one of those things where it's a shift of focus, right? For me, the Fallout games were the sense of individual relationships and individual exploration and just being able to go out and do whatever you want. And I have yet to see a board game do that successfully. Yeah, the total sandbox feel where it's like, you just emerge, okay, off you go. Right. No linear progression, no here's your straight line, no, you know, this twig is stopping my movement because it's between two rocks. None of that stuff. Just go where you need to go. It's why I'm skeptical of the Skyrim board game for the same reason. We'll see what they do. And there's a new, there's been, there was an old Witcher board game, but they're coming out with a new one. So we'll see, hopefully they capture the feel of that game a little better. This This one might be Witcher. Much more witch. On that note, thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at the games you like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236, and you can find us on Patreon. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>